Alright guys, so this is going to be the third video where we talk about modeling, um, and I guess we'll just head into it. So the first thing, let, let's just kind of go briefly go over like what our data looks like. So we'll have a MEL spectrogram with 128 frequency bins, so frequency is on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have time, so this dimension is going to be 100 because we chose a step size of 10 milliseconds for our MEL spectrogram. And when we kind of make a histogram of all these values, this is what it looks like. And remember, this is a log transform spectrogram, so these are all like negative. And so one thing we need to do before we actually feed this into the model is that we're going to do a normalization. Now, I've tried this with the, and I'm specifically talking about the frequency, I mean not the frequency, the normalization layer that uh, is within Capri. I've tried using frequency normalization. I wasn't able to get consistent results because the batches change all the time, but I have had good results with batch normalization. And when I say normalization, like I think sometimes people think scaling between zero and one. Um, I mean standardizing and then zero meaning that distribution. So what you get is just something that's centered around zero and it's kind of scaled nicely. Um, and this is very important because when you go to pass into like, so the first activation function that should happen um, within like a layer would be a hyperbolic tangent. And we'll, we'll start talking about that in the next slide actually. All right, so our first model is gonna be a 1D convolutional model that uses uh, these time distributed layers to kind of wrap the 1D convolutions over time. And I'll kind of talk about like what that is meant to do in terms of like why why even think to do that, right? But let's just first start with the input. So we have our input to our model, it's time series data, the channels are gonna be first. Um, we can compute the MEL spectrogram using Capri and Capri also has this normalization 2D. So that's actually exactly what we talked about in the previous slide where we wanna zero mean our data and rescale it. And then um, just for consistency, I actually do a permute on these dimensions. So it probably, actually it does matter here because I'm using a time distributed layer, but uh, when you use time distributed or you use any of these time-based layers like an LSTM, it will expect the dimensions to be batch by um, time, by features, by channel. And so when I do a permute, I actually just swap the features and time um, so that time is actually this first dimension here. And so now that it's kind of uh, ready to go, I use a time distributed 1D convolution with a really small kernel size on a hyperbolic tangent. So this initial hyperbolic tangent in the activation is very important because ReLU would literally like cut off half of your data. Um, so let's just like back up and talk about classification and what's the general goal with classification? The goal is to have a bunch of layers that can build out features from whatever your data is and reduce them down to the point that you can create some kind of classifier in the last few layers of the network. And those are typically called like the head of the network. So the head would be right down here. And so the idea behind this 1D convolutional model, and you can see I use a time distributed layer and eventually I do, you know, pull it down to just kind of reduce the dimensionality. Because you, you see it goes down and down and down. Um, the number of parameters that gets tuned goes up because of um, I keep increasing the number of features for each. Because you want to start general. You want to say, I just want a couple of features. And then I want to get more in depth and more in depth. And I'm, I'm more and more picky about what my network learns. Because at that point, this is where all the meaning comes from this 128 features that are in this last layer. But when you wrap it with a time distributed, what you're saying is go a long time and I'm going to give you all these little different frequencies. And there might be an edge here that's useful at a very specific frequency. And all of these features will all come together and have some kind of meaning. Um, as humans, we're not really going to be able to interpret it, but the neural network can learn quite a bit from this. And so the purpose of wrapping in a time distributed 1D convolution is you're taking 1D convolutions that only look at the frequency spectrum over time. And that's actually what you're building out. And so eventually we use something called global max pooling. So global max pooling 
basically instead of flattening this out instead of taking like six times two times 128 we only take those 128 features and we say hey these features are what we're going to use we don't really care about like where it happens in the neural network but here's your features you can try to make a classification with that and so um, I do a little bit of regularization in these models and drop out to try to reduce overfitting. Um, so that's kind of a good idea. But then uh, once you flatten this out with global max pooling 2D, you can use this dense layer to make your classifier and then you output into a softmax. And that'll be the number of classes. And this will be actually creating that hot encoded matrix that we talked about in the previous video. And so that's the 1D convolution. Um, let's go to the 2D convolution here. All right, so this is the 2D convolution. It should look fairly similar. Um, and if you've ever done some computer vision, then this is pretty much uh, a typical like computer vision approach. Um, so this is more from the perspective of, let's take a look at the entire spectrogram and we're not using any time distributed stuff. So features that are kind of next to each other and how they interact are all very meaningful. And there's really no concept of time necessarily. I mean, it is a dimension and it's certainly containing your data, but um, this is a typical computer vision kind of approach. And if you're interested in like just computer vision based architectures applied to audio, you can look up um, the network VGG-ish because it's meant to be very similar to something like this. Um, and it's, yeah, this is actually a much more simple network because uh, we have, so instead of using a 1D convolution, we're using 2D convolutions and we just look at the entire spectrum as a whole and we just try to pull that down and build some features from it until eventually I chose to flatten here. So flattening will be eight times seven times 32 you'll get uh, 1,792 features. And so if you guys are changing like your delta time and stuff, you know, you might have bigger, either you reduce your mel bands or you increase your, your time dimension. But the general goal with all these classification nets is to get this dimension small enough so that it doesn't take up a huge amount of memory, right? And all these networks are about the same size. But if you start taking up like millions and millions of parameters for something this simple, uh, it might not really work out for you, or it's just going to be a slow network. So just keep that in mind. And yeah, this is just the same old classification stuff. Um, a pretty standard computer vision approach to audio. All right, so let's actually take a look at the LSTM. This is uh, my favorite network all, out of all of them. And um, mainly because it's just meant specifically to take a look at features and how they change over time. And it's just a really interesting network. So again, um, we're going to use permute here to switch these two dimensions. So we expect batch by time, by features, by channels. And I actually do a reshape here. So because we're using mono channels and there's only one, um, the input, like, I guess what I should say when we have the input to an LSTM, there can't really be this channels dimension. So I do a reshape to merge it with um, this feature right here. And then I go into a dense layer. So this is actually something that I did not do in the original series. Um, and you, you could actually see that the LSTM didn't perform very well. So one thing that you can do before you actually enter into the LSTM is you can do a little bit of feature learning um, with this, this dense layer. It's a time distributed dense layer. So what I'm doing is I'm taking 64 uh, kind of activation units, uh, again, using hyperbolic tangent, but I'm just looking at these 128 features and I'm going to reduce them down a little bit so that I can try to learn some more relevant features before I even enter the LSTM. And this actually greatly improved the performance. Um, so now we go into a bi-directional LSTM. If you don't know what a bi-directional LSTM is, it's, uh, it's basically, it computes the gradient. It like goes forwards and backwards in time. So not only are you looking at the audio in a forward manner, but you're also looking at it from reverse. And that just tends to yield better gradient descent updates. So when you actually have your LSTM, uh, again, I reduce the number of features down to 32. Um, you actually, you do not need, LSTMs do not need a huge number of nodes in their network to actually like learn relevant information. 
Um, and then I chose to return the sequences. So um, the output of this will actually be, I think, 64. Yeah. So the features themselves coming out are going to be 64. And then I do something, um, it's quite common to do this, uh, it's called a skip connection. So I take the features from this dense layer, and I called it S, because I'm going to attach this as a skip connection later. And then I concatenate them with the output of the bidirectional LSTM. So 64 comes out of here, and 64 features before I went into the LSTM, I concatenate them together and I should recover uh, 128. And so this lets the neural network make decisions not only on the features that were learned before the LSTM, but it could choose to select the ones that come out of it. And um, this is actually quite uh, common for audio networks to have a skip connection from your LSTM. And then it's just normal uh, feature engineering with dense layers. So I'm just using dense, doing max pooling 1D, because again, we lost our, our channel information, so we can't do... Um, max pooling 2D, we have to use 1D. So we go down from 100 by 64 down to 50 by 64. And then we just keep going, we flatten it out to 1600 and then we fit a classifier. And um, that's kind of how the LSTM will work. And so now let's actually take a look at what these models look like when they train. So now let's take a look at the training plots from those three models. And you know, I kind of made the the one D convolutional model just for fun, but it turned out to do pretty well actually. And of all these networks, it's the one that overfits the least, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the other thing I would note about this data is that it is small. Um, I would never recommend to actually like if if you were really if you had a proper data size going for you, I would recommend the LSTM because I think it's going to just do a better job of fitting um, and you notice like with this big gap discrepancy between train and test um, it's it's a good network it's actually probably so good that it's just overfitting immediately whereas conf1d is like you know the features are a lot weaker so it kind of makes sense that it doesn't overfit um, but they all do pretty well and they're all different ways to approach modeling audio and you can run it with your own data to see you know what kind of results do you get right um, and, you know, I've tried to combat overfitting with this data set, but uh, it is tricky. Um, I think I used, yeah, I used an activity regularization at the output, and then I used some dropout between flatten, so that kind of helps. But I actually think that the biggest thing this data set has going against it is it's so small. Um, but the results should only kind of get better if you kind of bump up data size. So let's actually look at the code and we'll go over how to train some of this stuff. Okay guys, so I'm back in train.py and I've actually uncommented everything. So now it will actually go through the training process. And there's a couple of callbacks here. So we're gonna log to a CSV file that's gonna store in this logs directory. And there's gonna be a check pointer. So you can, it's set to validation loss, so the lowest validation loss will save um, the model, but you can set this to loss, you can set it to validation accuracy, whatever you want. Um, but now, so the only thing you should really have to change here is probably this model type. And it's expecting one of these three strings, and you'll get an error if they're not supported. So um, conf1d, conf2d, and lstm. I'm actually just going to train the LSTM here. And we can actually go through and do this. So I'm going to just run train.py. And okay, so while that's training, I am going to launch a Jupyter notebook. So. Uh, assuming that you have an IPython kernel like linked so that you can use this audio environment within a Jupyter Notebook. And it probably doesn't even matter because you just need to have matplotlib. But I'm going to launch that. And I'm going to go into the notebooks directory. And if you guys want to just check out these notebooks actually while we're here, 
Um, this is how I made a lot of those plots that you guys saw in the PowerPoint file. So if you want to go check that out, you can. But the notebook I'm interested in is going to be plot history. And this is how you make those plots. Um, so it's going to look for, it's going to look in the logs directory and grab all the CSV files. Take a look, see if this is done training. Okay, so it finished training. Training accuracy was, you know, in the 90s. Validation was, you know, somewhere in the 80s, usually. Yeah, so it's overfitting. And the LSTM overfit the most, right? So now that that's trained, take a look. So the CSV file looks like this. We've got the epoch, the accuracy, um, the loss, validation accuracy, validation loss. There they are. And I'm going to come back to my notebook, run all that code. And I already had all the CSVs in there, but there they are again. And this is how you can make those plots for any of these uh, audio algorithms that you want to test run. So it should be really easy. And I hope you guys liked the videos. Uh, yeah, so I almost forgot. Um, we should cover how to make predictions with the model because last time when I first made the series, I was like, hey, that's how you train it. And then I never showed people how to make predictions. So um, those models are going to log into the models directory and they're going to be what's like called H5 format. So it has all the weights and the architecture loaded into them for Keras. Uh, only funny thing with loading those models is that you have to use the custom objects here um, to make sure that it can recognize the MEL spectrogram or the norm 2D. So if you're using, if you know, you're trying to use different layers and you want to change these model files, then you have to remember to change those up there. Um, but this is a very simple example of how to make predictions on those original wave files that we had. So I'm actually, I could go into clean and I can make predictions on them, but um, you actually have to call down sample audio because I figured that was more relevant and like a more useful example. So again, we're doing the same stuff. We're calling down sample audio, cleaning with a signal envelope, and then we batch our audio data up so that we can make predictions um, with NumPy argmax on the output of the hot encoded probabilities. And actually, eh, well, you guys can print that out to see. Um, I'll show you guys what something like that would look like. So using that LSTM model, I think the LSTM model, yep, that we just created, um, you can see that it's outputting the wave file and then the corresponding label that it predicts for that. And it gets, you know, a lot of them correct, some are wrong. Um, the way it does this is it actually takes those one second intervals and it kind of like sums all the probabilities up and takes the average of them. Um, so it looks over every single second within those uh, audio files and you get usually it gets the right answer right it's not it's not perfect but I think again with this data set I think data size is the biggest thing holding it back um, and I've had some people email me and they you know they're running stuff and it it turns out perfect like they get some really good test accuracy so it really depends on your data right um, but yeah I think that's going to be it for the series um, if you guys enjoyed it or this is helpful for you um, then that's awesome because that's kind of the whole point and if you guys are having issues I will respond to your YouTube comment if I think it's like a good question I can answer it um, but if you have like if you're having formal issues with the code then feel free to raise an issue on github and I will get back to you so um, yeah thanks for watching the series guys and happy programming